Hey guys, Brian Schultz here with Cape Falcon Kayak, and I'm here in the studio today with my third full-size skin-on-frame canoe build of 2021. And this particular canoe has been finished for about a month now. I'm really happy with it. We've been doing a ton of testing on flat water and also on moving water, unloaded and loaded with camping gear. And I've been experimenting with different flotation strategies and different self-rescue strategies as well. So we've got a lot to talk about in this particular video, but before we get into that, as usual, if you're not familiar with me and my skin on frame canoe building system, make sure you check out the first video in this series, which is titled First Skin on Frame Canoe Build of 2021, because in that I give you a really comprehensive overview of the design history of these canoes, the construction techniques, and my skin on frame canoe building classes in general. And all that's just gonna give you a lot more context. So what we talk about in this video, which is just focused on this canoe, is gonna make more sense. So picking up where we left off in the last video, which was the second full-size solo skin-on-frame canoe build of 2021, if you watch that video, you'll remember that I was just starting to break through some design challenges that I've been working really hard on ever since I decided to evolve this from a system that was originally just designed to build pack canoes into something that might make full-size solo canoes, and even tandem canoes as well. And specifically what I'm talking about there is I'm just starting to get a much better idea of how length, width, depth, rocker, and overall hull shaping come together to create different types of performance for different size users, and also how to apply our formula-based system to predictably achieve those results. I also managed to add a couple inches of tumble home to the sides of the canoes, which makes a big difference for ergonomics and therefore the overall performance of the canoe. And I feel like all these things came together to create the first full-size solo canoe I've built that I feel like an avid solo canoeist could really take seriously. And so kind of building on the success of that last canoe, I felt like I could go a couple different directions. The first one is that I could build the next size down to see if the tumble home that we added would still be compatible with our nesting canoe system, or I could go a different direction inspired by a canoe that a student of mine just built that he's really happy with. And what he built was a 14 foot long canoe with the same cross section as the 15 footer that I just finished from the previous video, minus the tumble home on the sides. And what interests me about that is that it is so much easier to get clear, straight grained, 14 foot long lumber than it is to get the next size up, which is usually about 16 feet. And it was for that reason that my very first solo a couple years ago was actually a 14 footer, but with the hull shaping I was using at the time, I was having trouble getting the stability that I needed at that length. Now, fast forward to 2021 here, where we have a fuller hull section and more volume pushed towards the ends. That gives me a more positive stability curve so we can revisit this idea of a 14 footer for small to medium sized paddlers. Now, having actually used this boat at this point, I still think that an extra three to seven inches would be more ideal for someone my size at 160 pounds. But considering how well it does work at 14 feet long, I feel like this might be a really attractive option for small to medium sized paddlers that can't get those longer lumber lengths. So anyways, getting into the technical details here, this canoe is 13 foot 11 inches long. It is 29 inches wide at its widest point. It's 27 and a half inches wide at the gunnels, and it is 26 and a half inches wide at the waterline with a 170 pound load. It is 12 and a half inches deep in the middle, and it has a two and a half inch continuous rocker from end to end, which is a little more rocker than I typically recommend for my students, but I personally like a more maneuverable canoe. And the nice thing about this system is that you can fine tune some of those variables for your own personal preference. Now, the weight of this boat is 31 pounds with the seat installed, and the overall construction details are basically the same as the last boat. So I'm not gonna go into all the framing details because I did that in the last video. So if you're interested in the wood, the skin, the coating, any of the actual physical construction here, make sure you bounce over to that last video and check that out. All right, so before we get into the fun stuff here and start talking about how this performs, I just wanna reiterate that this is a general purpose canoe for someone my size. And the reason I wanna mention that is because 
The unique thing about our system is that unlike most other boat plants, it's not just a couple different canoe sizes, it's a huge range of canoe sizes that you can build just by applying different measurements to the formula. So I am 5'8", 160 pounds, but keep in mind that if you're a different size than me, your dimensions might end up being different. So anyways, um, the first test that I always do with any of my canoes is I just take it down to the river near my house for a quick flat water spin. And my first impressions of this boat were very much what I expected them to be. The fact that this boat is a foot shorter and a couple pounds lighter makes a big difference in how easy it is to take on and off the car and get down to the water. And that in and of itself might be a good reason to build a smaller canoe, even if you're like me and it's a little bit too small for you. Because the quicker and easier it is to deploy any small boat, the more often that you're going to use it. So taking this thing out on the water, um, first thing, the maneuverability, as you would expect, is a little bit better because it is a shorter canoe and it's got a little bit more rocker. With this boat in perfect conditions, I can spin it 180 degrees with two sweep strokes. And that's really the upper limit of what you want for general purpose boat maneuverability because anything more than that and you're going to have a really hard time keeping the boat going straight. Now, as far as the speed goes, this boat actually feels a little bit quicker than the 15 footer because it's a little bit shorter. And this is something I want to elaborate on for a minute because this is one of the biggest things that most people misunderstand about small boat design. Basically, we've all heard over the years that longer boats are faster, but what that means is that the longer your water line, the faster you can go before you start climbing up onto your bow wave, which is effectively a barrier for human powered paddling. But what it doesn't mean is that longer boats are more efficient because one of the downsides of making any boat longer is you have more contact with the water and that creates more drag. And so oftentimes if you can make a boat a little bit shorter, it will actually be a little bit more efficient and it will feel quicker on the water. But of course, the lower limit to that is that if you make it too short and you can actually achieve your hull speed and start climbing up on your bow wave, then you're not going to be able to go any faster. So it's really all about balancing the length and the wetted surface to the size of the paddler and how fast you need to travel. So you don't run into your hull speed, but you have the least amount of wetted surface possible. The only curveball that canoe design throws into that is that there are other reasons to make a boat longer than just the paddling efficiency. And one of the biggest ones of those is actually stability because anytime you make a boat shorter, you're reducing the length of the wide portion that's in the water. And that's the portion that does all the work to keep you stable. So oftentimes you might only need 13 and a half or 14 feet of canoe to be nice and efficient and quick on the water. But because of your size or in the gear you're going to be carrying it, you might actually need to make it more like 15 or even 16 feet to be stable, which is why you see so many commercial solos in that size range. So uh, this boat only has a limited capacity. I would say the upper limit of this would be myself at 160 pounds plus about 50 pounds of camping gear before it starts to get sluggish and it just doesn't perform very well. But my 15 footer could easily handle another 20 or 40 pounds of camping gear before the performance starts to deteriorate. So shorter boats are definitely more nimble, but they are more restricted in their general weight capacity. Hopefully that wasn't too technical. It's just something I like to mention. So anyways, going back to that stability there, this canoe, because it is a little bit shorter, does feel a little bit less stable on the water, but it's much more stable than the 14 foot solo I built a few years ago because we've added that fullness to the hull shape. Right now I've got the seat sitting pretty high. It's about nine and a half inches from the top of the seat to the bottom of the canoe. And I'm still really comfortable sitting up on the seat. Although generally when I'm actually paddling, I'm paddling down on my knees using the seat as a kneeling thwart, just because that gives you so much better control of the canoe. But it's nice to have the option to sit up high because especially if you're on long trips, it really helps with your comfort to be able to mix things up. So those are kind of my initial impressions of the boat. It seems really quick. It's nice and maneuverable, but it's not so maneuverable. I can't keep it under control. It's pretty stable, but not as stable as the 15 footer. And it's really easy to get on and off the car.
So moving on from there, I figured the next place I wanted to test this is I hadn't done a lot of canoeing in moving water and I just got off the John Day trip. If you happen to watch that video, you know that we went down the John Day River for eight days with two canoes catamaran together, which is a really fun and interesting way to run a river. But the entire time I found myself kind of wanting to get more experience just solo canoeing in moving water. And so because I was already familiar with that river system and we'd scouted some other sections, we decided to load the canoe up. I purchased a couple different kinds of float bags and we took it up to the upper North Fork of the John Day River where I spent about three days just running back and forth down the river and testing it out and really just starting to learn for myself about how to pilot a canoe on moving water. I started out the first day just in a swift water pool with a bunch of rocky obstacles and I took the canoe out and I just started practicing going around the rocks and going in and out of the current. And I felt like my background as a whitewater kayaker was helpful there because I already understand how rivers work and how to move in moving water. But it was kind of fun and interesting just to get used to how I needed to throw my body and my weight around in the canoe. And one of the biggest things I found that was helpful is just learning to trust the boat and really getting it up on edge and really getting it out so I could make those aggressive spins and maneuvers. And once I felt like I had that dialed in, uh, we got some float bags and laced them into the boat, uh, shuttled a few miles up the river, and I just ran kind of a shallow, mellow class two section. And uh, that was actually incredibly fun. Not exactly what you wanna do with my standard layup here because my standard layup is really pretty equivalent to a mid-weight carbon Kevlar weave. So something that can handle the occasional rock, but not something you wanna be crashing through shallow water all the time. So I didn't hurt the boat, but I did get some pretty bad scratches along the bottom. And if I was gonna be doing that frequently, I would definitely go to a heavier skin. But just spending time kind of maneuvering and you know weaving my way in through all the rocks and the channels, I felt like I got some good skill progression and I had a lot of fun on the river that day. So after our first run down the river, I decided to do some self-rescue practice because honestly, one of the biggest things that freaks me out as a newer solo canoeist is what do you do if you end up too far away from shore to swim back and you're out of your boat by yourself? And quite honestly, as a sea kayaking instructor, what I've always told people is the best way to stay safe in those situations is not to get into those situations in the first place because no self-rescue is gonna be 100% reliable. And one of the biggest reasons to practice solo self-rescue in a kayak or a canoe is just so you can get a sense of what's gonna be realistic so you can make appropriate risk assessments when deciding whether or not to make a crossing. So I really had no idea how this was gonna go in a canoe. So what we did was purchase multiple different brands of float bags in multiple different sizes. And we laced them into the canoe and took them out into a mellow spot in the river. And I just started from scratch, tipping the canoe over and then trying to get back in, tipping it over and trying to get back in with different size float bags and different gear loads. And just to give you some details there, the float bags that I found worked the best were the large size solo float bags from NRS. Um, I'm talking about the nylon ones, not the PVC ones. And the rescue that I found worked the best was those float bags combined with my normal camping load, which is a 57 liter dry bag with 40 pounds of gear in it. And that gave me good flotation, but also good stability. I was able to get back in and able to paddle the boat over to shore. And I felt like with enough practice, I might be able to do that in more of a rough situation as well. So that was really illuminating and I'll probably do a separate video on that as I get more experience with those things as well. So after the moving water test with the boat, next thing we did was took a couple weeks, kind of digested what we'd learned and all the filming and then headed back up to the mountains looking for flat water lakes so I could start to kind of learn how this boat really feels in just a simple flat water context. And so we found a couple good locations. I took the boat out on some extremely mosquito infested, but also very beautiful high mountain lakes, 
did some maneuvering practice, and then just really spent a couple days working on my stroke. Because as a new solo canoeist in a fairly maneuverable canoe, I would say that my J stroke is pretty atrocious. And up until this last weekend, if you watched me on the water, you'd be seeing quite a bit of tail wagging. But after a while, I finally got my mojo down and I was able to keep things tracking nice and straight with a nice smooth C stroke. I'm still not to the level where I'm gonna be able to do inside turns on my C stroke, but it is nice just to feel, you know, a little bit more competent. And I think really, I'm glad that for my own personal canoe and my own personal paddling style, I have been starting with more rocker and a smaller canoe paddle because it's really been forcing me to learn better technique instead of just relying on a skeg and a really big paddle for control. But once again, this is totally a matter of personal preference. And if you don't wanna put that much work into your stroke, you could always go with a bigger paddle and you could always build these canoes with a little bit less rocker. And I think that kind of brings me into a good segue of how I would modify these boats if I wanted to push things more towards flat water or white water performance. So for someone my size, if I was just gonna build this for flat water or maybe a little bit of moving water, I would probably make it about eight inches longer, one inch narrower and a half inch shallower. And that's gonna give me similar displacement, but it's gonna give me better ergonomics and a little bit cleaner power delivery. If I wasn't gonna be doing a lot of touring in it, I might even think about dropping the rocker by a half inch just to make it a little bit more directionally stable without so much input from the stroke. Now, on the other hand, if I was gonna push this exclusively towards moving water and white water, I would leave it the same length, but I would add another inch of width because even though I don't like reaching out that far when I'm paddling, you definitely want a little bit more of an edge to lean on, especially as you get into bigger water. Running this down class two for a couple days, at least shallow class two, I felt perfectly comfortable in it, but as a dedicated boat, it's always nice to have a good hard edge that you can rely on. I would also think about going to a 12 ounce skin on this instead of a nine ounce skin if I was gonna be paddling frequently in shallow water. Because even though this is a surprisingly tough layup, if you're crashing into things constantly, you are gonna wear it out prematurely. So lots of different directions that you can go with these boats. And if you wanna see more about what other people are doing with the system, check out the student builds tab on my website because on that you're gonna find a map of the world where all these different canoes and kayaks have been built. And you're gonna see a drop down menu where you can click on different people's builds that have chosen to blog their build in exchange for a discount on plans. One build that I'm really excited about is actually a tandem that was just finished up in British Columbia by a gentleman who built the entire thing out of yellow cedar. So all these different builds going on right now, really cool to see all the different contributions that come from all of my students and hear about all their experiences. So I guess some final words on this canoe here. I'm trying to think of what I haven't covered yet. Uh, just like all of my other small canoes, this has my simple pop-up sail rig in it, which I'm not gonna go into detail here because I've talked about that in so many other videos, but it works just like it works in the other one. And in a canoe of this size, just gives you a nice push if there happens to be a favorable breeze coming from behind or coming from the stern quarter. If you get into my pack canoes that are a little finer and sit deeper in the water, you can actually sail beam to the wind with that. Um, I'd used a slightly different coloring system on this boat. Generally, I color my canoes with acid dye painted onto the nylon before I apply the coating. But this time I decided to do some experiments with rare earth pigments suspended in the coating. Because even though there are some potential chemistry issues there, and also it's a little trickier to put on because if you don't put it on perfectly even, it can look really bad. There is the potential added advantage that that's gonna give you better UV protection and a boat that looks nicer for longer. The only real big downside, I think, to the rare earth pigment, in addition to the application process, is that you don't have quite the same range of vivid colors. And initially, I really wasn't that stoked on this boat. It looks kind of like a dead fish to me, but it's really growing on me, and it's just nice to paddle a really muted color when you're out in nature, so. Uh, other things I've been doing with this canoe, I've been really trying to get into trout fishing actually, which is a little weird for me because 
Coming from an ocean fishing and steelhead fishing background, I'm not used to catching fish that are smaller than 24 inches, but because of some of the changes with my health over the last, you know, 10 years, I can't quite get out into those conditions. So I've been trying to kind of explore the whole peaceful vibe of being out in a canoe and just catching little trout. Um, not necessarily the most effective strategy to fish for trout out of a canoe on a river, but works really great when I'm out on the lakes. So that's kind of cool as well. Um, still trying to figure out the exact seating position for my solo canoe recommendations. Um, on this boat, I actually built three different seats and put in provisions for three different seating locations just so I could explore a really wide range of balance. And where I think I'm ultimately gonna be heading with that is just recommending two different seat positions in each of my canoes. One that's very close to the center for when you're out kind of in flat water conditions or you're interested in doing some freestyle work. And also when you're gonna be putting a gear load directly behind you so the canoe is balanced properly and then a further back position that you might be able to switch that same seat to some technical challenges there that I'm gonna to have to solve, but hopefully we can get it done with one seat. And then that would let you balance the boat a little bit more, especially in following seas, so you're not digging and hunting so well. So just different technical things that I'm always working on here. Overall, I'm really happy with this boat. It's been a really big surprise to me how well it works at 14 feet. I would still personally like this boat to be a little bit longer, but the fact you can build it with 14 foot lumber is pretty cool. So I think that's it for now. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. You can also find us on our website, capefalconkayaks.com, where I've got a bunch more skin on frame building videos, plan sets, and various free skin on frame resources. You can find us on Instagram at Cape Falcon Builds, where we post a daily build blog of everything we're working on in the shop. And as usual, even if you're not normally a social media person, I would really encourage you to check out the Instagram because it is so much easier for me to share things there than it is for me to share things here. So if you wanna see more skin on frame paddling videos, building videos, photo essays, and a lot of skin on frame building tips that you're not gonna find anywhere else except for inside of my paid courses. Make sure you check that out at Cape Falcon Builds on Instagram. And finally, take care, be safe on the water, and have fun building your skin boat.